if we wanted to check our acromancia level, how 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 do we do? How do we go about that? And and what what kind of level would we be? Should we be looking for? Well, now I'm going to get in trouble because you asked me that question because I'm going to say something <laughs> unpopular, which is that uh, I don't really think the gut microbiome tests out there are, are so great. And and I'll say this: they're they're an important tool that needs to be developed. And I I just I don't think that they'll never get there. I don't think they're quite there today. Um, mm. There is no kind of standardization across gut microbiome tests. Um, if you're ever running a test or an assay or diagnostic, there's usually sensitivity and specificity um, that you have to hit for those assays for them to be kind of um, approved and usable. And we just aren't there yet with microbiome tests. There are a wide variety of microbiome tests and they, we don't have any standardization across them. Additionally, in any moment in time, your gut microbiome test might show something that is much more about a temporal thing that's happened than really the, the state of affairs. What I mean by that is that um, you could have done something as extreme as like just taking an antibiotic, but you also could have done something less extreme, which is uh, I don't eat Vietnamese food very often, but last night I had Vietnamese food um, or something else that, you know, I had an incredibly stressful day yesterday. These are things that can actually in a short time temporally alter your gut microbiome, but it's not really kind of the state of affairs. And so if people are going to use gut microbiome tests, I highly recommend you do multiple and you collect longitudinal data about yourself. And you're really trying to understand when are there changes and what is kind of the stable, you know, place that my microbiome is at. Because if you just take one test and you're going to go off of that, you could easily be misled. Um, that being, and then the other thing I would say is that even though I said a healthy person has kind of one to three percent of their gut is acromancia, um, it is an ecosystem. So just looking at acromancia outside the context of that full ecosystem could also be misleading. And so, and we really just don't know enough about the science to know well what are those other strains and what should the ratios be. So even though. You could take a gut test and it could report back to you that you're in the red zone, you're lower missing acromancy. And you could think, oh my gosh, if I could get that back, I could be, you know, uh, more attractive and smarter and uh, thinner. Um, you know, that might not be the thing that is uh, telling you what you should be doing. And then conversely, you might have really high levels of acromancia and benefit from taking acromancia. So I just think right now it's a little bit hard to use those tests. And I would much more go off of symptoms and um, things that you can actually measure outcomes of than simply just your gut microbiome test. And now all the people who run gut microbiome tests are going to be really annoyed with me. <laughs> right. So interesting. Now, I saw that one of the on your website, one of the uh, trials you were looking at was for menopausal women. Um, and you were going to look at, like, I, I guess the effect on the microbiome, but but I, I think it also has impact on bone density. And so could you talk a little bit about that trial and particularly what, what is the impact of kind of menopause on the microbiome and what could women do to kind of help get through that time? Yeah, well, I, I would say one of the things that I have been really pleasantly surprised by in, in this company is how much genuine interest there is in the microbiome and in these novel strains and how creative people are in thinking about mechanism and things that these strains are tied to that are outside the scope of what we were looking at. We were really focused on metabolic syndrome. In no place in my mind was I thinking about bone density or menopause uh, that's associated with osteoporosis. This investigative group out of Australia reached out to us and said, we understand you have acromancia. We're super interested in its potential role in osteoporosis associated with menopause. And it is a huge issue. I mean, I'm a woman who thinks about osteoporosis after menopause. We're constantly popping calcium and thinking about it and worrying about it. And, and we know that there's some hormones that you take when you go through menopause that can actually reduce your bone density. And so it's really an, an important thing. And, and, and also that having osteoporosis or going having reduced bone density means that you, know, you fall, you break bones. It's an incredibly important thing to go after. And uh, sadly, you know, not something that was on our mind. So this investigator's hypothesis is that by giving acromancia um, to women who are going through menopause or postmenopausal, it can help replenish the bone density that's associated with osteoporosis. And we are just excited to give them acromancia to, to run the trial and, and see what happens um, and to help them try to recruit people into that 
you know, important study. Where do you see kind of the future of research into Akamantia and I guess the, the microbiome in general? Well, I still think there's a lot to be had around metabolism and metabolic mm. health because of the fact that the food that you eat is metabolized by your gut microbiome and that we really don't fully understand what are the bugs that help you metabolize different foods and how can they have impact on your metabolic health. So I think there's a lot more to be had there. But getting outside of that, you know, we kind of touched a little bit on it with the, the gut skin axis. So thinking about the impact of the gut on dermatology um, and the gut brain axis, of course, is incredibly interesting. Um a couple of things there, which are that, first of all, I actually didn't know this until I started really studying the gut microbiome. You have, of course, you have neurons in your brain. We all know that you've got neurons in your brain. And when they die, uh, they're gone. They never come back. It's one of the reasons you tell teenagers don't drink because you lose all your brain cells. Um, but you also have neurons in your gut. And unlike the neurons in your brain, the ones in your gut they do turn over and they do replenish. And furthermore, one of the most interesting things that was discovered is that um, when it comes to Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease, there are these plaques that form in the in the in the brain. And um, I started my kind of scientific career trying to do drug discovery around Parkinson's, and we were so fixated on the brain and those plaques. And how do we get rid of those plaques? And how do you get stuff across the blood brain barrier? Well, it turns out that you can see those plaques start in the gut neurons before you see them show up in the brain neurons. And so the current leading hypothesis is that there's actually something that happens in the gut that causes those gut neurons to go awry. They then send neurotransmitters to the brain. There's literally a vagus nerve that connects your gut to your brain and that that misfiring or whatever that neurotransmission is that's gone awry in the gut then makes its way into the brain. And because the brain cells don't regenerate the way the gut does, then these plaques can really start to grow. And that's all kind of hypothesis now based on a few observations, but um, it could be incredibly powerful if the gut is actually a way to tackle at an early stage, these neurodegenerative diseases. Kind of at a, a, on a, from a different angle of the gut microbiome, we know that the gut produces more serotonin than even your brain does. And we also know that the gut produces GABA. And again, there's this vagus nerve where these neurotransmitters can make their way from the gut to the brain. Um, and one of the most interesting things that we've just discovered about acromancia is that it has all the putative genes to produce GABA. And we actually just recently went into our manufacturing floor and said, well, I wonder if it's producing GABA here in the tank. So when we grow our strain, we, if you've ever been to like a winery or, or a brewery, these big metal tanks, it looks a lot like that in our manufacturing plant. We grow these strains in media, and then we spin the cells down. We take those cells, we freeze dry them, we, we, you know, we harvest them, we freeze dry them, we put them into pills. That's the magic stuff. And we take all that media and we throw it down the drain. In that media is not only a ton of GABA, but all of the precursors to GABA, all those small molecules are sitting in that media that we're just throwing down the drain. And so what we know is that even while it's growing in our tanks, acromancy is producing GABA. And so I think one of the really interesting things will be to start to understand the role of the gut microbiome and potentially acromancy itself on um, stress and anxiety and things that we know are associated with lower GABA levels. Um, so I think those are some of the most exciting things outside of you know the... Um, things that we've talked about. Yeah, that is really interesting. So one question I should have asked, actually. So you, I think you mentioned that uh, acromancia goes down with age. Is that correct? And, you know, like yeah, how, much, you, how much do we see that? Yeah, you, uh, unfortunately, as we age, uh, there is this trending of uh, losing acromancy and generally speaking, diversity of the microbiome. And the diversity of the microbiome is important because there's all these different functions that your microbiome is supposed to be doing that if you start to lose them, that's where you start to get these health issues. But acromancy is one of the key ones that gets depleted over time. Mm. Okay. Do you have any idea like what age that starts or is that too vague a question? <laughs> Um, I, I, it's sort of a continuum. So I don't think there's an age like, oh, you turn 40. That's it. There's a big drop. I don't think there's step function changes, uh, kind of happens over time, but really fascinating. There was a, a study done in, um, uh, centenarians. So people who are, you know, gotten to a hundred years old and they actually have, um, relatively high levels of acromancia compared to, uh, kind of their, their younger counterparts. And so there is kind of this interest from the longevity community around, 
you know, could acromancia help us uh, kind of improve healthy aging? And I think that underlying that is this question about glucose metabolism. So we know that one of the most important factors to healthy aging is being able to continue to metabolize glucose. And so um, if acromancia is one of the key things that's depleted in a person that's keeping them from being able to do that, you can imagine giving that back and assist with this sort of whole longevity game that we're all trying to play. So one uh, question for you. So what what is your longevity protocol? So you you kind of talked about worrying about uh, osteoporosis, and but what does your longevity protocol look like? If you're okay to share, sure. I mean, on a, on a personal level, I do fundamentally believe that glucose control is such an important part of being able to age well. And I believed that, but then um, I don't think I really believe that because I don't think I was thinking too much about it until I did this trial on myself and work continues glucose monitor and realized that my energy and my workouts were stronger. My energy was better and more sustained through the day. And I realized, oh my gosh, this is one of the things that as we age, we kind of just assume as part of aging, like, oh, as you age, you kind of get more tired. You get tired more easily. You don't have the energy of a child. We all look at toddlers and think, oh my gosh, what if I, if I had the energy of a five-year-old, how amazing would that be? We sort of just accept that as we get older, we're going to have less energy. And by taking these microbes and realizing that I had boosted energy, I realized that, no, that's not true. We actually, I don't have to accept that. There are things that I can be doing to, to kind of um, change the, the, the way in which I'm aging. And so um, I think some of the most important things for me are, of course, you know, replenishing my gut with the strains that are assisting with glucose control. Sleep, I think I've always been very, uh, very good sleeper. I don't want to brag, but a very good napper and sleeper. Um, and I think that it is important. Your body needs time. We don't fully understand this, but it needs time to like kind of shut down and replenish things. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, I mean, my kids even laugh at me. They go to bed. I go to bed before they do. Sometimes they tuck me in, but I have like a time when I'm going to bed and I don't care what's happening. I'm going to sleep. And so I think sleep is a really important part of this. And, um, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'd like to say that I'm really good about nutrition, but I'm actually pretty terrible about it. I love bourbon and I love donuts and that's not, uh, doesn't make for good nutrition. So it's mostly the gut microbiome, the sleep, and then, you know, just trying to not overeat. I think you can eat a lot of different kinds of foods if you are managing portion control. So those are the main things, sleep and gut. <laughs> So I, I remember my question. So you said that acromantia may be one to three percent. So this was actually a fairly large component. Uh, but that, I mean, one to three percent actually seems quite small to me. So it's like that diverse. I mean, would typically most strains or species be represented by less than one percent? Yeah, I mean, it's believed that you have somewhere between, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of different strains that are sitting around your gut microbiome. So when you think about that, constituting, you know, 1% is pretty abundant. Um, and, and most of the strains are actually quite low, which is why these gut microbiome tests have uh, really, we, we didn't really know what these strains were for a long time. We were kind of culturing strains and seeing what was in there. And so we ended up with lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. That's what you see if you look at the back of labels of most probiotics, mm. that's what's in there. And we didn't know about these other strains because they're at much lower levels. And that's why gut microbiome tests use DNA sequencing in order to try to discover what are all the strains in your microbiome. And so you're literally getting, you know, um, millions and millions of DNA data points in order to understand what is your microbiome constitution, because most of them are at really, really low uh, relative levels. So 1% to 3% is actually huge. Interesting. And you need to know what you're looking for, right? So you need to say, okay, this piece of DNA comes from this bug. It's not like you can tell from the DNA what the bug is. Like You, you need to know what you're looking for. Yeah, it's it's like uh, you know you're you're sort of a uh, a scientist that has this piece of the puzzle and you got to hold it up to the big picture and say where where is this thing fitting in and, and that's actually been a really big challenge in the microbiome space. It's it's getting better over time, but we're still not there yet. Which is to say that there's still a substantial portion of things that get sequenced. And we're not actually sure what the strain is. And sometimes the fragments are so small that they could be assigned to lots of different strains. And so it's still, that science is still being worked out as well. Okay. So is there anything that I haven't asked you that I should have asked you, do you think? Um, 
no, we, this is a great uh, set of questions. We got, we got, we went deep. I didn't know we were going to go that deep, but I would say maybe, you know, the most important thing that I hope that people walk away with is really starting to investigate some of these new strains and to not think of probiotics as all being equal. And, you know, the probiotics that are sitting on the shelves right now, we've all kind of stood in the grocery store, the drugstore, and just seen rows and rows of probiotics and thought, oh my gosh, what's one's right for me? What should I be doing? And you're right to feel that way because if you start reading the labels, you're going to find that they really are all kind of the same things in varying ratios and different you know, CFUs. And so what I would love for people to leave here knowing is that there are next generation strains that are going to deliver a different promise from what's on the shelves today. And you should go look up Acromancia. And I think you'll just be fascinated by uh, what people know about. There's almost 3,000 publications on this strain, mm-hmm. even though it was just discovered um, Acromancia. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So where can people go to find out about uh, Pendulum and uh, your work? Uh, well, we'd love for people to come to our website, pendulumlife.com. Uh, we have actually our publications on there. We have all the science on there. Um, and so people can sort of hang out on the website and do a little deeper dive into the research. Um, and to purchase the products, you can purchase them on the website at pendulumlife.com. They can also be purchased on Amazon. Um, and if you're a physician, they can be purchased through Fullscript and Emerson. And so um, those are the the um, e-commerce ways. We are not in retail yet, but uh, one day. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, okay, uh, Dr. Cutcliffe, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, that was really helpful. Thank you so much for having me.